So th thank you very much, Julien, for this great introduction and for this invitation. And hi, everybody. Yes. It, it puts a bit pressure on me, uh, all the nice things you said. Uh, so we, the purpose of the talk is a uh, question for uh, analogy making as a fireable but fertile necessity. So as uh, Julien said, uh, I want to mention that it's a joint work with Douglas of Statter. And uh, in fact, the book we wrote together had two original books. One was in French and the other one in English, but two are original ones. Um, so just to introduce the topic, uh, we'll start with a few sentences that uh, children are uh, saying when they start to use language. And in these three examples, uh, I think it's quite striking the fact that there are analogies involved. Okay, so if we take the first one, I undress the orange, you can see that there is an analogy between undressing a person and uh, taking the skin uh, of the orange, and you can make the same comment for the other examples. Um, it does not stop with uh, when we are growing, and sometimes adults are making a kind of uh, speeches, uh, uh, let's say, approximation. And you have a few examples as well. The first one, that someone is saying that he's, he saw a finished movie about a woman transporting, uh, transporting a turkey in an airplane. And you see the wife is correcting him. And the movie was not finished, but Icelandic. And the, it was not a turkey, but a goose. And th this illustrates our semantic proximity the kind of analogy that we are making and that reveals the way that uh, concepts uh, work in, in our mind. And we have also a few, few other examples. This is another kind of illustration where analogy <coughs> takes place when you, you try to speak about a phenomena in, in uh, using the words and the context of another phenomenon. So this is a case with a climate uh, change with the Titanic. Um, and as uh, Julien says, it really d also deeply concerns scientific discoveries. Uh, and here we have two uh, uh, f phrases, sentences from the first one from Einstein and the second one from the mathematician Cédric Villani, who got the Fields medals in mathematics. So the first one says, uh, the idea that the principle of such great um, uh, simplicity, uh, and he's speaking about Galilean relativity, would work perfectly in one area of physics, yet at the same time would not work in another area of physics, struck me as a priori very unlikely. And what you say, just uh, claiming that there should uh, be an analogy between several areas of physics, and it was a very strong driving force in Einstein's view. And w about Cédric Villani, uh, as you can read it, uh, he's saying that this is really the, his analogical uh, uh, talent that made him a successful mathematician, so he's saying the ability to detect connections between different areas of mathematics is what has met my reputation. These connections are invaluable. It's a bit like a game of ping pong. Every discovery you make on one side helps you discover something new on the other. Another example uh, uh, to, to introduce the uh, following of the talk in a, a funny way. So this is a moth uh, that has been discovered in 2017. And, and do you know what n how it was named? This is its scientific name. It was named the Neopalpa <laughs> Donald <Yeah>. Trumpy. <laughs> <laughs> so during my talk, I will have uh, three men uh, claims that will drive the talk. Um, so the first one is that the analogy making is a driving force of thought from the most mundane to the most sophisticated cognitive activities. 
The second claim, which is a very important that, that will, I will really emphasize, is the idea that analogy making and categorization are in fact two sides of the same coin. And uh, I would say it's really the stronger claim that we make in, a, in our book. And I will speak about a mechanism that we consider as guiding conceptual development that we call e categorical extension by analogy. And at the last part of the talk will be uh, an experimental part when, when I will <coughs> present uh, experimental studies that follow the direction of the theoretical uh, part. So when we speak about analogies, maybe some of you are a bit familiar with the fields. There is a, a tradition of uh, the Aristotelian view of what is an analogy. And this uh, view uh, ref is referring to what are usually called um, four terms, analogies, or um, proportional analogies, which have the form of uh, D is to C was B is to A, and the idea that there is a common relation that is uh, shared among the, the two parts of the of the equation, let's say. And you can find in the etymology of the word analogy the, an evolution from the idea of mathematical proportion to the one of uh, relation. When we come to more contemporary view of analogy making, uh, the idea of uh, proportional analogy is, a, uh, is not so useful anymore. And there is a more contemporary view of analogy, which is the idea that uh, there is a source which belongs to our past knowledge, and there is a target which is a new situation. And the uh, uh, analogy in this perspective is uh, currently seen as, as an adaptive phenomenon because uh, it's uh, making reference to something which is already known in order to face, to deal with something which is unknown. So a way to define, to characterize analogy is that the target is understood uh, in the term of a source. And there has been since uh, 40 years a very strong uh, contribution, especially from uh, experimental psychology and from cognitive science, that uh, can, that shows that analogy is sometimes very efficient, which means that uh, when you, a source <coughs> domain is provided, for instance, to students, it can be very helpful to solve a problem that wouldn't be solved if the source was not provided. But another result is that uh, the access in memory is uh, uh, uncertain and based on often on irrelevant cues. What does it mean? It means that if the um, analogy is helped by uh, pointing out explicitly what is the source, it's often a success. But when a person has to find by uh, herself the relevant source, then it's much more difficult. And we will discuss this point, especially when I will speak about the empirical works. And also it's connected to work on conceptual metaphors that I will not go too strongly into, but which is deeply connected. Uh, for instance, there is a, this idea that um, a lot of our knowledge is uh, metaphorically uh, built. For instance, when we are speaking about a debate, uh, there is a, an implicit metaphor that a debate is a kind of fight and you can find it in the usual way of speaking about a debate, such as saying uh, he, he to stick to his position. And in the same way, there is a metaphorical connection between the perceiving the sense of vision and <coughs> understanding, as when you say to change the point of view. So a few ideas regarding analogy making that uh, I will rely on. So f the first idea is that facing without any background knowledge would be an un unachievable challenge. And so relying on what is known in order to deal with new situations what is what makes possible to benefit from the past. So th this is really one of the key ideas about the influence of analogy making. 
And so, as I said, analogy making has a very strong adaptive value. Why? Because we can say that having a low cognitive cost, because it only requires to use already built knowledge, and it also has a very high inferential power, because once you refer to this previous knowledge, you can benefit from all the inferences uh, due to the past experience that you have regarding the, the situation. So a uh, key idea that we define in our book is, is that um, every fraction of second, we, the human being, we are facing unique events. It means that every event in its way is singular, and we are facing it. Um, and uh, the, the idea is that uh, analogy making will be intimately uh, tied to categorization because uh, we, are, we will build concepts uh, in the course of our life through a succession of analogies, and the concepts will be also evoked through analogies. So this will be what I will mostly illustrate during the, the talk. Um, so I, I, because we are facing unprecedented situation, we, uh, we cannot treat them uh, as uh, we never face uh, as completely new, because we, if we were doing so, we will, no, we will do no better than newborns. So the only way we have to deal with an event is to link it with previous knowledge. And uh, this kind of previous knowledge that we already experienced, would it be personally or vicariously? And the idea is that it's true at any scale, from the most mundane situation to the most complex ones. And this is a, the key reason why analogy making is central in, uh, in human cognition. So the first uh, manifestation of analogy making concerns what we are calling intuitive analogies. And the intuitive analogies are the analogy that makes us possible to have a first interpretation of a situation. And it's especially important in, the, in school education where we are speaking about notions that will be studied uh, at school. And we will start with a with an example, for instance, uh, if we are speaking about subtraction, the notion of subtraction, and if I invite you to invent a subtraction problem that can be solved by the operation 8 minus 3 equals 5, uh, so I just propose you to try to invent such a, such a problem. Everybody wants to make a try? Okay, so probably, if you have it in your mind, it's, it's, it's okay. But more than 90% of the people are proposing this kind of problem. It means that you start with a quantity of something, and then an event uh, happens that makes the quantity decrease, and the question is more or less always how many is left. And this is an indication of what is the intuitive analogy that is uh, behind subtracting, is that looking for what is left, knowing what was at the beginning, and knowing what was taken off. Um, it, you might think that uh, it's a good description of subtraction, but in fact, it is not at all a good uh, description of subtraction. For instance, if we are looking for a, a situation where you, I ask exactly the same question, but I add a constraint, and the constraint is that you lose nothing, but you only win. At the first, it might look a bit like a paradox, as how can you look for a subtraction, but only winning. But in fact, there are many cases like this. For instance, when you say Paul has three marbles, he wins some during the break, and now he has eight. How many marbles did he win? You can see that it's a very respectable case of a uh, statement problem of subtraction, but uh, we are 
the goal is not to look uh, how many is left. What's interesting in this situation, uh, I will <coughs> go quite fast to s say a word about it, but we will come to it later when we we'll, we'll speak about experimental venues. But this is a typology of all the kind of subtraction problems, and the one which is really compatible with the, intuit with the intuitive analogy is only one amongst 11 kind of problems. So it's, it really shows a relation between the intuitive analogies that can be really a narrow scope compared to the scientific notion. So the intuitive analogies, when you look, start to look for them, you can find them more or less everywhere. So I just take another example, which is coming from the technology. And if we just try to name what we are looking at the, in this slide, you can see this is a desk, this is a window, this is a site, uh, this is a trash box, uh, here are uh, files, uh, you have some documents, uh, this is surf, you have a network, you have a mailbox, you have a page, you have a menu, and as you see, they are all uh, from the digital world uh, vocabulary, and they show how, um, in fact, all the new technology is also built on uh, familiar knowledge which uh, existed much before uh, this technology uh, uh, ex existed and that you can find in dictionaries with, uh, from one, uh, 100 years ago before anybody were thinking that one day internet will exist. And this phenomena is, uh, can be reversed, and there is a phenomenon that we call technomorphism, in which the analogy uh, can go the other way around, as you can see in this uh, uh, humoristic drawing. And, uh, and this, this time, this is a teacher that is explaining to the child the idea of reading as analogous to uh, installing a software. So, as I told you, a st very strong claim is this idea that uh, analogy and categorization are two sides of the same coin. And uh, what I will uh, argue is that the relation between analogy making and categorization is, let's say, mostly ignored in the academic literature. It, it's starting to change a bit, but, but it really took a long time. And this reason is because of a misleading intuitive conception of both phenomena. And so wh what, what intuitive conception uh, I'm speaking about? First, there is an intuitive conception of categorization that was very entrenched up to the 70s, I would say, in the minds of uh, uh, even if in the mind of academics, mm -hmm. and that remained influent in, in a way. And this view of categorization is this idea of mental boxes, and that uh, having a category, a mental category, is, is as having a mental box. For instance, the category of shares would be a kind of mental box that we have, and we can imagine that uh, it will activate uh, this category in our mind if we see a chair. So this is this intuitive uh, conception. Uh, and uh, I will, we will see uh, it's a misleading uh, intuitive analogy. And regarding analogy making, there are two intuitive views that also are in, uh, in, in, a, in a way misleading. The first one is uh, proportional analogies that I briefly talked about. So when you know three terms and you look for the fourth one, so I guess everybody is used to this kind of analogies. And another one, which is uh, more close to the contemporary view of analogy making, is when you try to compare uh, two situations from distinct domains. So as you see, you have also some examples, and I'm sure all of you will say, yes, we see this is are cases of analogies. Um, but this, uh, this is misleading as well because the range of analogy making is much wider. 
and what makes it um, much wider. So in our book, we are speaking about what we are calling the banalogies. And the banalogies, in fact, are all the analogies that we are making unconsciously and that stay hidden in a way and that we don't consider as a, a strong cases of analogy. And these are just a few examples. For instance, when you go in a hotel room and you take a shower, and the shower, this is the first time that you see it, and how do you manage to use it? And the idea is that, it, that you use it by analogy with many experiences that you have with previous showers in many places. You can say the same for an elevator uh, that you take for the first time. And when you go to a supermarket, you never went <coughs> before, and you are looking, for, let's say, for the salt, how do you uh, go to, how do you do to move into the supermarket and to look for the salt? And so th this is a kind of analogy that we are calling the banalogies. Or for instance, a conference room like this one, the first time I'm giving a talk here, but by analogy with quite many experience, uh, I, can, uh, I can manage. If we come back to this relation between analogy making and categorization, there are some kind of striking uh, closeness that I want to emphasize. The first one is when you look for definition of both mechanism, uh, as you see, the first one, uh, when you say that an analogy is what allows us to make the novel seem familiar, and in another paper, uh, you have this definition about categorization. Categorization let people treat new things as if they were familiar. As you can see, it's very close de definitions. And the also uh, about the functions of both mechanism, uh, there is the idea of uh, predicting properties of a new situation. Uh, for instance, in a work about analogy making, in an analogy, a familiar domain is used to understand a novel domain in order to highlight important similarities be between the domains or to predict new f features about the novel domain. Or in, in a paper about categorization, in one can establish that an object is in a category, one is in position to predict a lot about that object. So in both cases, you have the idea of relying on previous knowledge in order to face a new situation, and about the inferential power that you can uh, have from this uh, phenomenon. I will now um, try to show how, the, how is it blurry to distinguish between analogy making and categorization. For instance, um, let's say the concept, the category of key. So if you go to a hotel, a um, long time ago, you would recite this kind of key. But now there is a strong probability that what you will receive will be more this uh, plastic uh, uh, card. And <coughs> it became very common to call it a key. And if I ask you if uh, this plastic card is a member of a category key or if it's analogous to a, a key, so I am sure you see how the distinction is blurry or how we, we have the choice to say both of the claims. And we can think this way for many things. So for instance, if we use a plastic card to open the door, so that it makes it uh, does does it make them locks, and of course I think we can argue that this is the case. Um, also, if we take this uh, image with a lot of letter A, capital A, and we are trying to think what makes them a capital A, except the fact that there is a, they are analogous between them and they all belong to this same category of capital A. Or if you try to ask to yourself, this is a chair, and as you see, this chair has many uh, features that are not common to many chairs, and, and it's part of the, let's say, the analogical halo that uh, characterizes the category of chairs. And 
Also, if we ask questions such as this one, is a hat an article of clothing? Uh, usually, uh, in an audience, we, we could do it, but uh, <laughs> more or less half of the people say yes and half of the people say no. Okay? Because uh, it's also an illustration of the a kind of continuum that, uh, of, uh, uh, that there exists in, in categories. And this is very, uh, 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 very convergent with the idea of concept being uh, made of analogous members, which means that a hat has uh, many uh, common properties, many analogous properties with usual uh, clauses, but also has, have differences. But it, it shows that uh, belonging to a category is really a continuum, and there is no clear uh, cuts. And this is what makes uh, similarity with, uh, that makes, that explain why we can speak about analogy making as a, uh, uh, really uh, making uh, the strength of belonging of a, to a category. Another illustration of the link between uh, analogy making and categorization, uh, a nice illustration I think is uh, proverbs. Because when we use proverbs, usually uh, a proverb uh, is nearly an, uh, <coughs> an explicit an analogy. I mean, you, when you, you are using a proverb, you make an analogy between a situation that, that you are encountering and the wording of the proverb. And on the reverse way, I think it's quite clear that the proverb describes categories of situations. So as you see, there is uh, the two sides. One side is that you, the proverb is an explicit analogy with the situation that you encounter. And it's also the, a label of, uh, of a category. For instance, uh, it's, it's a case, let's say, uh, I Everybody, I guess, is familiar with the uh, wording of uh, sour grape situations. And you know, sour grape situations, it refers to the fable of uh, Aesop's. And um, in fact, we use it as a label that describes uh, a, a category of situations. And it's also uh, a direct analogy with uh, Aesop fable. Another illustration of the explicit relation between analogy making and categorization is, uh, I will go deeper into it, the <coughs> next part of the conference, but when you see such expressions, either 9, 11 of, uh, of something, uh, you see it's, uh, it's becoming a category, and it's a category, of course, which is in which the analogy is very explicit. Um, at the beginning of the talk, I was speaking about the idea that uh, th you can uh, try to give an account of how concepts are evolving in one's mind based on uh, mechanisms that we call uh, uh, analogical, categorical extension by, an by analogy. And the idea is that when we look about how mm. concept is uh, developing, uh, uh, it's the idea that categories are growing by welcoming new members uh, <coughs> that sometimes are central to the category and sometimes are lying way out of the fringe. And for welcoming unexpected members, uh, analogy will be the motor that will drive, that drive what we call categorical extensions. And uh, in fact, uh, even if it's not intuitive, uh, all the time we are facing such categorical challenge. It means that we are encountering situations that don't fall exactly in the <laughs> pre-existing categories and that requires such as uh, 
such uh, analogical process. I will illustrate this with a, let's say, a kind of a, a allegory of the process, but I think which is a nice illustration. Let's uh, look at this uh, photography and let's consider it as a potential member of a category. So we have to try to imagine what this category will, <coughs> will, will look like. And if we try to add a new member to this category, let's say this one, we are starting uh, to, to build a category which is starting to become a bit abstract. And we can imagine, for instance, what might be the next uh, member of the category. Mm -hmm. And is, is there a face that is evoked for you by these two members? Yes, somebody has a guess? Younger Mark Twain. OK, another one? Einstein. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we can keep on with the uh, Pfizer. And you see that through this process, this is really what we call the uh, categorical extension by analogy, we are starting to really make a more sophisticated concept. And we can, uh, we started and we can uh, keep on going. And in this way, we will start to have uh, a category which will have uh, very strong and central members and also members which will be very f uh, far from the center. And the same way that we ask uh, if, if a hat is a piece of clothes, we can ask ourselves which face is supposed to be either a, mem a strong member of the category or there will be also cases that will be really uh, at, the, at the border of the category. Um, <coughs> Another illustration of this phenomenon is when you, you start uh, with, a, uh, with a proper noun, and the proper noun is becoming a label of a category. Uh, so for instance, we, we took uh, Trump at the beginning, so we come back to him. And if you look at uh, the category of trumps, in fact, you can find it on the internet. What is a trump? And here you have a few examples that you can find on the web. For instance, in a, is Biden the trump of the Democrats, who Bolsonaro have his name, the <laughs> trump of the tropics. Uh, also, Sanders is uh, considered by some as a trump of the left. And here you have uh, uh, you see McDonald, which is considered as the Trump of the corporations. This is a very interesting illustration of this phenomenon of a concept uh, which is starting by one unique member and that is growing through this kind of analogical extensions. If we look at these two photographs, uh, as you can see, they both, the, the, it's, uh, it's the same uh, tree, but it's not uh, the same season. And what you can see is here, it's quite clear that you see the shadow, okay? But here, it might, it looks uh, as a shadow, but if you look more carefully at the sky, in fact, it's winter, and the, there, are, uh, there is no sun. And this is, uh, uh, as you can see, in fact, this is not a shadow from the sun, OK? Uh, and the question would be, is it a shadow? And in fact, I, in a way, it's a quite a tricky question because it's, it, uh, it's not the result of the absence of light. But anyway, we can see it as a, a shadow because uh, in both cases, uh, you have a medium with straight linear flow is interrupted by an obstacle. And beyond that obstacle, there is a perceptible absence of the medium. 
Okay. And so, as you see, if you look at it this way, the irrelevant are the nature and the speed of the medium and the time it takes to create the effect. So this one might be called, let's say, a snow shadow, and this one might be called a light shadow. Okay, and you see that by this process, uh, it's really uh, analogy making, which is the center of the process, and it's a driving abstraction because we started from uh, a view that shadow is really due to the absence of uh, light, and then we can extend it. We can extend the category of shadow uh, with this mechanism of uh, analogical extension. And it's a, it's a way to see it as very important in scientific discoveries. And uh, in fact, this uh, view of a shadow in a more abstract way uh, can be uh, seen in some uh, other domains. For instance, in uh, demography, uh, here you can see World War, World War II cast a decades long shadow on the birth rates of many nations. And you see the idea of shadow is very abstract here, but it's really connected to the one we, we spoke about before. Uh, and you see the effect of uh, the male being uh, killed uh, during the war. Uh, the, it makes a shadow on the, the population. And uh, you have also this kind of use of shadow in, in uh, uh, ge geography. Uh, such uh, which is called the rain shadow effect. And the rain shadow effect is not the, the lack of, of uh, water near uh, a, a special place, but it's when you have uh, high mountains that are blocking, uh, uh, and because of this, you have some desert places, and this is called rain shadow as a technical, uh, technical term. And I will mention also the case of uh, Galilei, Galileo, uh, that you can see is very close to the one, uh, I, uh, the question of the trumps, okay? Because you, at the time of Galileo, there was only one moon. This was the moon, and it was only writ written with a capital letter. And what did Galileo was really to make it a, a category. And from one moon, there became many moons. And so th this is why we are losing the capital letter. And there is a plural. And it's the same for, uh, for the sense. Okay. So I hope we, we saw uh, this kind of movement from a singular uh, uh, element that can become uh, a category uh, thanks to this uh, an analogical uh, extension uh, mechanisms. So uh, I will now illustrate with some experimental works uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, regard the some dimension of this uh, theoretical <coughs> framework. The first one concerns the field of analogical retrieval. And the field of analogical retrieval concerns the questions of what makes you think about something else. And uh, in the literature regarding this, and the second one will be about the strength of and robustness of analogical encoding and about the educational attainment. So Julien <coughs> told that we are a lot working in, in educational psychology and I will show some of the work regarding this uh, topic. So the question of uh, superiority of essence over surface in analogical retrieval, uh, which was conducted with uh, two colleagues, Lucas Renal and Evelyn Clement. And uh, in the analogy literature, for those of you who are, are familiar with it, but um, if not, I will uh, summarize it. Uh, during a long time, there have been the ideas that uh, uh, um, the retrieval in analogy making is mainly driven by superficial features, which means that uh, even if we are able to make strong analogies where, when we know what is the source and what is the target, 
uh, our memory is a kind of uh, inefficient regarding the access uh, mechanism and we can have a, a quote uh, regarding this question uh, from Gantner and Colon in 2010 relational retrieval can be said to be the Achilles heel of our relational capacity there is considerable evidence that similar similarity based retrieval unlike the mapping process is more influenced by surface similarity than structural similarity um, so what we argue is this, this supposed superiority of surface similarity it's a bit suspicious if analogy making is really seen as a driving force of thinking because it looks a, a bit inefficient of uh, uh, being reminded on superficial cues instead of uh, structural cues. So that's the reason why we defend the idea that human beings in fact go as deep as they can go and that retrieval is also preferentially driven by structural similarities. And so uh, what we what we did in uh, two works that I will uh, present uh, quite briefly, but I, will, I, I hope it will be clear, uh, is that, uh, in fact, uh, if we, you take the, the usual uh, experimental designs regarding this uh, topic, the idea is that you, you study uh, source stories and then you look target stories and you are looking f of what uh, source story is uh, evoked by the target story. And the pre predominant view, as I said, is the superiority of, su of surface similarity. And how was it uh, showed, or what did the experimental work show, is that if you start with a target story, uh, after having read two source stories, the one which will uh, be reminded by the participant is the one who is sharing the surface similarity. But in fact, what we what happens is that uh, in reality, uh, the the source story that is evoked shares not only only surface but also structure even if it shares less structure than another one so what we did uh, <coughs> is that we introduced stories that either share only structure or share only surface uh, so it's, it's a way to dissociate two factors uh, So this is the design of the experiment. As you see, uh, you, we have one source story that share only surface similarity, one source story that share only structural similarity, and four distractors that share no similarity at all. And what we find is that when you really succeed in dissociating both uh, the structural similarity are very successful, which means that when there is a possibility to dissociate the two factors, uh, reminding is really uh, driven by structural similarity, which is quite a new result in, the, in, in this area. And, and another way to study this phenomenon is to look, uh, oh, sorry, I, I did not mention that there, there is a control task to show that in the previous experiment there was a strong overlap in structure similarity. And for this, we asked to the participants to, uh, uh, to uh, put the cursor uh, before the first, the first word when the story uh, stopped to be structurally similar. So when you look to the, and we look for the mean proportion of text before the cursor. So as you see, this is previous um, uh, material and this is our material. And what you see is that if you look from uh, uh, where the participants are putting the cursor, 
They are putting the cursor more or less at half of the story and the previous material. And when it comes to our material, they are putting the cursor at, th at the beginning of the story. So it was a way to check that in our material there was no structural overlap, but in the previous material there was structural overlap. Another study uh, regarding, uh, sorry, still regarding this question of um, structural uh, superiority in, a rec in recall, in retrieval, uh, regards a, a free recall reminding paradigm. And the idea is that you, you give a scenario to participants, for instance, you say, I had to go to the do-it-yourself store to buy a light bulb, but every day I was saying to myself that I would rather go there tomorrow, and I only bought it some two weeks later. And what we ask to the participants, if if they can remind from their past experience situations, uh, wh what kind of situation it reminds them of. And we look if this is superficial similarity or structural similarity. And what we found is, in fact, is also is also that the, surf the structure was uh, really uh, superior than the surface, which means that when you design the task correctly, the retrieval is really driven by structural uh, similarities. So the the second part of the experimental task uh, regards so the strength of, of and robustness of analogical encoding and the uh, educational entailments. Um, I will uh, I, uh, introduce the question of the intuitive analogies and the idea, as we saw with subtractions, that these intuitive analogies are uh, influencing the way situations are represented. And this concerns uh, the process of analogical encoding, which is a process by which a situation is first encoded by a, by a lay person. Uh, and uh, when this encoding is not efficient, which is really often the case at school when we are studying new notions, the question is a question of uh, the semantic recoding, which means the possibility to see it uh, in a new way, and this new way will uh, make it possible to see the analogy that are valid from the scientific point of view, which means by the, on the point of view of the notion that is uh, taught at school, but which is not uh, obvious from an intuitive point of view. And this is, this, uh, these are educational entitlements which, which are important because it provides a way to foster learning at school. Uh, 